So I have with me a map. Now, because we're on a university campus and I see some students here, born in the mid to late 90s, I may need to explain this a little bit more. This is a map and it's printed on paper. Um, it's not really that interactive. If I want to zoom into this map, I can kind of hold it closer to my face. If I want to zoom out a little bit further away, if I want to make the map bigger, I can open it up. And if I want to make it smaller, I can fold it back. In theory, I can do that. Notice I only opened it one fold because I decided doing more than that. I don't want to spend my whole talk folding this map back up. It's very, very difficult to do. And despite the fact that I'm bad at folding maps, I've got an affinity for them. See, my family, I grew up with these maps. My family and I would take a trip every summer to Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. We'd drive from Dallas to Colorado, 14 hours in a vehicle with my dad and my mom and my two loving but younger brothers. Uh, this is in the paper map era, as I like to call it, which coincides with the pre-iPad, uh, pre-in-car entertainment system era. So we didn't have a lot to do. So one of the things we did is we used the map. We love to help navigate, or to at least think we were helping navigate. Now, if you're uninitiated to maps like this, you'll notice they have city names, they have roads, but they also have lots of little bitty numbers on them. And those numbers are mileage measurements between two points. One of our favorite things to do on these trips was to try to find alternate routes and then try to convince my dad to take the alternate routes. Uh, so we would spend time doing math. It was, a, it was, yes, we were doing math in the car and it was enjoyable. Uh, adding up all these mileages and then trying to convince my dad that this route was two miles faster and that this is the one we needed to take. And that was fun for us, we enjoyed it. And as I look back on that, I realize how much through life I've enjoyed the journey. It's one of the reasons I find travel such an exciting industry to be a part of. It's why I love working for Sabre, a technology company that powers that journey from beginning to end. And this journey, one of the reasons I love it so much is there's no one way to make it. If you wanted to fly from New York to London, and you'd already picked your dates, New York to London, and you know when you're leaving, and you know when you're coming back, there are over three billion different routes for you to take on that journey. Now, not all of them are very good. I don't recommend flying from LGA to FLL out to LAX, to AUH, to DOH, to DXB out to LHR. That's 43 hours in the air, not counting layovers and any delays you might have. But that myriad of different options is exciting. And it's more than just the options of the journey of moving from one place to another place that I find exciting. I find it exciting thinking about moving in one point in time to another point in time, from the present to the future. I lead a group within Sabre called Sabre Labs, and our focus is on the future of travel, capabilities that we think impact travel over the next decade. And a decade seems like a small amount of time for something to change, but I think if we looked at another uh, antiquated travel tool, I might be able to convince you differently. This is cutting technology from 2007, uh, used in travel, business travelers, leisure travelers alike. This is the manila folder. This is our best technology at the time, and this is not that long ago. If you think this is during the internet era, you can buy your flight online and print out the confirmation, even check in, print out the boarding pass. You can have your travel agent email you your hotel confirmation and your car confirmation and print those out. You can even get online and get a map that routes you exactly to your destination. Print that out online and you take that novella of travel information and you slide it in this manila folder and then you spend the rest of the trip holding the folder really close to you because you know if you drop it that your trip is almost ruined. Um, <laughs> And just to think, in less than 10 years, in less than 10 years, we have moved this, everything that went into this folder, onto a device that fits in your pocket and that I can view on my watch. Really an amazing change. And some people don't like that kind of change. It scares them. But for myself and for my group, we get excited by it. Because not only do we get excited because that was a very cool change to live through, we get excited by the potential that change like that can happen again. And it might even be starting right now with technologies that are just coming onto the scene. 
So today I want to talk to you about three technologies that we're looking at within the lab that we think could impact travel over the next decade. The first is actually a side effect of moving everything from manila folders onto your device. You see, your travel manila folder wasn't the only folder that you had. You had a file cabinet full of folders, and each of those has turned into one, two, three apps on your phone, maybe more. This idea that we have too many apps, it even has a name, it's called app fatigue. In fact, the latest data from Comscore says that we spend 96% of the time on our phones in our top 10 apps, and 80% of our time in just our top three. So this idea that if you build it, they will come as a mobile strategy is, has passed us by, and we're, we're looking for different strategies. One of those is the idea of embedding functionality from your app into the apps that are used most often, specifically messaging apps. So this is already happening in China with WeChat, a huge messaging app over there. Last I saw, 600 million monthly active users are using WeChat. And from WeChat, your messaging app, there's a panel where you can do things like order a taxi, pay your utility bill, even book, train, and plane tickets, all initiated from within the messaging app that takes you out to another location. Facebook Messenger is exploring something even more advanced, letting you use natural language to do, that with, to do things within the Messenger app itself. Just this week, KLM, the airline, announced that it's partnered with Facebook Messenger and will soon roll, roll out a customer service offering that will let you do things like check into your flight and check your flight status directly from the Messenger app. And this isn't just happening on text messages, it's also happening when, with using our voice, voice-based interfaces as well. We see we're at an exciting time when the technology of microphones, noise cancellations, and batteries have come along at the same time we've gotten better at understanding languages and better at understanding more languages. And those things come together for technologies that people like to use. A Google survey recently found that over half of teenagers were using voice search on a daily basis. And when I'm on university campuses like this, I find people very optimistic and a lot of usage around voice based interfaces. And we think that this changes the way we used to move, we used to have data in manila folders and then we put them on devices and we look at them on devices and maybe one day we're asking our devices, where's my flight, where's my hotel? And that represents an interesting transition. But it's not the only transition that we're looking at. Another experience that we're interested in the travel context is virtual reality. Most of our digital experiences today are really one-sided. We interact from the outside with a screen. We put a screen in front of you and you interact with that thing. The promise of virtual reality is to put you right in the middle of that experience and you interact with that experience all around you. Now, when we first talk to people about this in travel, they say, hey, Mark, uh, isn't, aren't you scared this is gonna replace travel? Uh, I, I don't think so at all. One of the things is the virtual experience can never, never replace the true in-life experience. And it also doesn't get to give you the journey of how you got there. But what it can do is provide a really powerful tool for inspiration and for communication. We're already seeing travel companies adopt this. Thomas Cook, a UK travel agency, has used it uh, to try to upsell seats. What you do is you put on the virtual reality headset and you look at the back of the seat in front of you in economy, right? The seat is right here. And then they tell you what economy plus is, which if you read it, it's just six inches of extra legroom. But when you see it and you see that six inches, it makes a significant difference in what your experience could be. So they've been experimenting with how to use that as they try to, to sell travel and make people have an enjoyable experience. We've seen Qantas Airlines use it as an entertainment option for their first class passengers, that they understand that on uh, several of their long haul flights, that maybe sitting in a plane the whole time isn't the best experience. What if we immersed you in a different experience while you were doing this to make that trip more enjoyable? And Marriott, this is the picture of their 4D experience that they did last year in which uh, they did a virtual reality of a beach, a live capture of a beach scene, headphones, and in this pod they also pumped in warm air and mist to give you the feeling of what that beach could be like and to inspire you to travel there. 
So we think this is a really powerful idea, this idea of pre-travel, that I'm going to experience a place that I plan on going, and maybe even be able to do more things now, make reservations, uh, observe some, some coming features than we can online. And no talk about going from here to there is complete without talking about autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. And a lot of the conversation around self-driving cars, especially in travel, is around this last mile that we call it, ground transportation, getting you from the airport to the hotel, the hotel to the theme park or to your meeting, and back again. And in fact, Uber recently announced a partnership with Carnegie Mellon University to build a research facility that's solely focused on self-driving cars. And so we definitely see this having an impact on the last mile of travel. But we're also starting to think about what about its impact beyond just the last mile of travel. What does a medium haul uh, self-driving car ride look like from Dallas to Houston? What, what does that impact have on travel and the way I choose travel? What about an overnight car? Is that, how do we build one of those? Is that a comfortable thing for me to do? What, what are the options around cars that would drive all night for you, maybe from Dallas to way out in West Texas? And so we, we look at these self-driving cars and realize they're a little bit away, but that we see the progress they could be making towards impacting the future of travel. So we've looked at conversational interfaces, we've looked at virtual reality, we looked at autonomous vehicles, and I hope you're excited about what these things could do for the future of travel, what the future of travel might look like. But I hope that you're not just thinking of the future of travel as a destination that's out there somewhere. I hope you think of it as a journey from where we are today to where we could be. I hope that you're thinking about technologies and ways where the things you're doing could be impacting that future of travel, and I hope we can do that together. Thank you.